All right, sorry about that. Can you guys uh, hear me now? Yes. Awesome, great. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, what I was saying was that I've graded your midterm, so I, I have them here with me. Um, so if you're on Zoom, of course, I'll, I'll bring them next week so you guys can pick them up. Uh, and the average on the midterm is about 34 out of 50, uh, which was, you know, of course, lower than the first midterm, but that that kind of always happens for uh, for this class. And so, you know, it's nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. Okay. Um, and so, um, you know, for those of you here today, you can come pick it up, of course, but then next week, if you guys pick it up, uh, definitely look them over. If I've made any mistakes with grading, just, then let me know. I'm, I'm always happy to, to do that again. Okay. And so the other thing I was saying is that um, I've already heard from a couple groups for the regarding the final project. And so we talked about it on Tuesday. Um, and so remember, you're going to be working together in groups of four on the final project. And uh, I'm letting you guys choose your own group. So, um, you know, I've already heard from a couple groups. Um, if you've already formed your, your group, just go ahead and send me an email uh, with all the people's names that are going to be working together on the project. And then send me a list of either like two or three or four topics that you would like to work on as well. Okay. And so I'm going to have the cutoff be this Sunday. And so if I don't hear from you by this Sunday, I'm, I'm going to assume um, that you want me to just kind of put you in another group. And so what I'll do on Sunday is that for anyone that's not in a group, I'll either form new groups uh, with those people or I'll, I'll, or I'll add um, people to other people's groups. Okay. And so even if you have two or three people um, that you want to work together with, but you can't find you know um, uh, other people to, to, uh, to round it out, let me know as well, so that I know that you know if there's someone you want to work with on the final project, then I can, I can work with that. So I can either I can keep you two together, or I can add people to your guys' group. So, um, you know, just let me know by the end. Okay. All right, and then the other announcement is homework six, and so that is the individual writing assignment. And so remember that's due uh, next Sunday, and so that's going to be on eleven twenty. Uh, so remember, remember to be working on that, um, and remember that's uh, individual. Okay, so make sure you guys are, are doing that. And remember the point of homework six is that it's 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 a very miniature version of the final project. But the idea is that you you kind of you do it, you you know, you try to you kind of um get used to the um kind of get used to researching things and, and writing about it because you know, we haven't done that at all in this class. And then you'll get feedback from me in terms of you know um, the research that you did and how you write um, how you write it so that you can apply that feedback to the final project. Okay. Because I always hated it, uh, at least when I was a student, when you know we had this kind of very big final project. But you know that final project was very different from everything else that we did in the class. And so you know we didn't, as a student, I didn't really know how to approach it or how I was how I was supposed to do it. So homework six is um, you know kind of a a way to um, to go about it. Okay. Uh, all right, and so that's it for my announcements. And so are there any questions I can answer before we get started for today? Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and pick up where we left off on Tuesday. So Tuesday, we were talking about uh, health and uh, health and safety, okay? Um, and then we're gonna continue that discussion today because it's, um, you know, I think probably the most important part of engineering ethics, okay? All Okay, so let's talk about you know how we how we actually deal with safety risks. And so on Tuesday, you know, we introduced this idea that engineering products or engineering um, you know uh, projects they have a direct impact on the lives of the people that that use them, right? And so we want to make sure that they're safe, that they're you know good to use, so no one really gets hurt. Okay, and so we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that today, and we're going to be talking a lot about this idea of of risk. Okay. And so if you remember from last time, the way that we defined risk was, you know, risk is basically just the probability that uh, you will come under harm or you'll get hurt, okay? So that's kind of a very, I would say, quantitative way to just define risk. And so, you know, if you have a situation, there's a certain probability or there's a certain percent chance that you're going to get hurt from it. Um, and that's how we define risk. Okay? But what we'll see today is that depending on who you talk to, everyone kind of has their own definition of risk. 
And it's very situation specific too. So what, what may seem risky to some people may not be risky to other people. And how one person defines risk in a certain situation may be different compared to you know, how they define risk in another situation. So we're gonna dive, we're gonna, we're gonna dive a bit deeper into this today. And we're gonna be talking a lot about this idea of acceptable risk. Because as we know, you know, when you engage in any kind of activity, there's, there's always a risk that something bad is going to happen, right? Even just something as mundane as just walking down the street, right? You walk down the street, there's a risk that there's going to be some uneven sidewalk or something, you're going to trip on it, you're going to fall on your face, and you're going to end up on some teenager's TikTok, you know? Uh, you know there's, always, there's always that kind of risk, right? Um, but just because there's risk in something doesn't mean that we should not engage in, in activity, right? And so... You know, even though you have that risk walking down the sidewalk, you're still going to walk down the sidewalk. You just you just accept the fact that something may happen. Okay, um, and so acceptable risk is is kind of this idea that you know even even though we're aware that harm or something bad is going to happen, we still engage in it because the benefits outweigh um, the negative consequences. Okay? And so whether or not we determine a risk is acceptable or not, you know, it depends a lot on our perspective. And of course, it depends a lot on the, uh, on the activity that's being um, undergone. Okay? And so we're going to look at this idea of, of acceptable risk from lots of different lenses so that you can kind of see how people uh, normally think about these, these things. Okay? And of course, you know, nothing, nothing that we cover today is, is going to be groundbreaking information. And so you know, uh, I think we all, every day throughout uh, um, you know, throughout all the, the various things that we engage with, we're always thinking about acceptable risk. And so it's, it's nothing, I don't think anything today is going to be, you know, you know, it's not, it's not going to, you know, flip, 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 flip on its head, you know, your, your, your thoughts on risk. But I think it's good to kind of just list it all out, just to have, kind of have it all uh, in front of you, just so that you can, you can kind of see all these different perspectives at, at once. Okay. Uh, any questions on, on this so far? Okay, so let's uh, let's let's think about this from a utilitarian perspective first. Okay. And so if you remember from, uh, from last week, when we talked about utilitarianism, it was all about this idea of maximizing the well-being of society as a whole, okay? And so we can take this, we can kind of take this, um, this lens right here and use it to deem whether a risk is acceptable or not, okay? And so under this, under this paradigm here, we can say that a risk is considered acceptable when the probability and magnitude of harm is equal to or, or exceeded by the probability and magnitude of the benefit, okay? And I'll write that down because that was kind of a, a, a tongue twister here. Okay. 
So we and so you you kind of form this uh, this almost like mathematical relationship. And so what you say is that you take the probability of harm. which of course is, is risk, okay? And then you multiply that by the magnitude of the harm. Okay. If this product right here, if this product is less than or equal to, well, I'll, I'll say less than, less than the product and uh, the product of the probability and magnitude of the benefit, And so if you kind of form this, this kind of almost pseudo mathematical relationship here, and if this, if this holds true, then, um, you know, the risk is acceptable, okay? okay. And so the way utilitarianism usually comes in, remember utilitarianism, it, it seeks to maximize kind of the benefits for a lot of people at the cost of individuals, okay? And so for this one, Okay. When we talk about the magnitude of benefit from a utilitarianism perspective, you know, maybe we are going to undergo a risk that's going to, you know, benefit, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. Okay. okay. Versus on the on the risk side, you know, maybe the people that are harmed is going to be very very few. And so in that perspective, you know, um, you know, and we'll say the probability is, is about the same for both. And so we'll say the probability is about 100%, okay? And so because, you know, the, an action may benefit a lot more people while hurt, while harming, you know, a few others, um, you know, usually this, this map, this pseudo mathematical relationship will, will be, will be good, okay? And so in those situations where we can give a lot of positive benefit to a lot of people, um, that's usually something that's acceptable from a utilitarianism point of view. So that's and so that's generally kind of the uh, the train of thought, or that's generally the logic that uh, that's followed if you you know are following utilitarianism. Okay, but of course, as as we talked about before, utilitarianism has it's it's quite a flawed way of thinking. So you know, I think it can be applied to to some things, of course, but it can't be applied to um, a lot of different things. Okay, kind of the the most notable flaw with this that I would say is that you know we. You're, you're kind of forcing yourself to put numbers on 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 all of these things and use an equation like this okay And so traditionally, you know, the way that we, the way that we quantify the magnitude of a benefit or the magnitude of a harm, you know, usually we put some financial, we put some, you know, dollar sign. On. So, so we quantify in terms of, you know, the, um, the amount of economic benefit or the economic harm to people.
and that can work in, in some cases, but then, um, you know, there are a lot of cases that it doesn't work as well. And so, you know, just, just kind of just very plainly, you know, how do you quantify economically the, the cost of a farm, right? You may be able to quantify in terms of, you know, maybe the cost of the doctor visit or maybe the cost of like a, a medical procedure that you may have to uh, undergo if you, if you receive a harm. Uh, but that, but, you know, uh, if, if that's not, that's never the whole cost, right? Because if you do, if you are harmed to a certain extent where you have to go to the hospital, get an operation, there's also the lost uh, time that you're going to have uh, from your job, right? And so that's time that you're not working. Uh, but it's also just lost time in your life. And, uh, you know, uh, maybe you miss, you know, certain important life events like like a loved one's birthday party or something like that. And so, you know, putting putting numbers on on those kinds of things is is never an easy thing. But uh, and and it's very controversial in a lot of ways. But you know, that's typically how it's it's done for this. Okay? But of course, you know, because because of of the troubles that it it can um, you know it can it can pose in terms of putting numbers on on these things. This is kind of a very I would say almost like a very robotic way of, of kind of thinking about it. And so um, when you're talking about ethics, you're always invariably talking about people and, and how people experience their lives. And I don't know if we can put numbers on the way that we experience a lot of things in life. And so, you know, I think this can be used. I, and so in other words, you know, I think this can be useful in some cases, but, you know, there's a lot of other cases where I think this is, I think, at least in my opinion, not an appropriate way to, to think about a lot of these things. Okay. Uh, but at the same time, you know, um, I think this is kind of a good starting point, uh, maybe not from a numbers perspective, but just kind of intuitively, when you think about, you know, who's getting harmed in a certain, certain situation, what's the probability of their harm versus how much a certain action can help and the probability of, of them helping as, as well. Okay. All right. Uh, any questions on, on this? Okay, so that's one way. That's one way to think about risk. And so, if the if you um, you know think about it, you know, from in terms of that equation, either with numbers or with not without, then you know that's that's one way. Another way that we can um, think about risk is in terms of what, what I like to call a capabilities approach. Okay. All right. So, like I just mentioned, you know, when we talk about ethics, engineering ethics, we're, we're invariably we're talking about the people that are that are interacting with our engineering products, right? Um, and so, those people have um, capabilities, right? <laughs> And by capabilities, what I mean is the is the ability for these individuals to live the kind of life that they have reason to value. Okay. And so, you know, this, this goes, I think, beyond kind of our traditional definitions before, where we think of, you know, for, at least from a utilitarian perspective, we think of just the economic benefits or, or, or the harms, or, you know, we think of, you know, loss of life. And so this, this kind of goes beyond that. And so what we're saying is that, you know, the people that use our engineering products, you know, they have a kind of lifestyle that they, that, that they want to live. And we want to make sure that the, the risks 
that they're undergoing by using our engineering products is not going to harm their, their capabilities to, to do that, okay? All right, and so of course, you know, this, this definition of, of, of uh, uh, capabilities is, is very vague. Um, and so, you know, in order to actually use this from a practical standpoint, we have to kind of, you know, kind of bring it, live it down to earth, okay? And so one way that we can kind of assess or to kind of measure capabilities is to um, think about some indicators or some concrete indicators correlated with these capabilities, okay? And so as an example, you know, one capability that I think is, is important for a lot of people is the ability to live a healthy lifestyle, right? And so um, in other words, you know, if we kind of narrow that down a bit more, the ability for someone to exercise, okay? And so, of course, you know, the capability of, of someone to exercise depends very much on the individual, right? Um, I can speak for myself where I definitely have the capability to exercise. I just choose not to because I'm lazy. But we can, uh, but we can come up with some other indicators that, uh, um, you know, that we can measure, that we can quantify and measure to assess someone's ability to exercise, okay? And so some indicators for this could be things like access uh, to things like safe roads or like a park or a gym, okay? Okay, because those are typically the places that people like to exercise. And so, you know, let's say that, you know, we're working on, on a construction uh, project. Okay, so we're, um, you know, servicing the roads or something like that. And so we want to make sure that the, um, that the project or how we, how we view the construction, how we do the construction is not going to dramatically impact people's access to the parks and the rooms. It's hard to see the word next to indicators. Um, it's, it's that. Oh, correlate. Thank you. Yeah, it's a correlate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, and so if we if we're under if we're undertaking a, an engineering project that will impede that, and so you know maybe people. We're, we're not going to be able to take like a direct route to a park or a gym. That's something that has to be taken into account. Okay. All right. And so, and so under this approach, under this capabilities approach, we can come up with another definition for acceptable risk. All right, and so under this kind of framework, a risk is deemed acceptable if the probability is sufficiently small that the adverse effect um, will fall below a threshold of minimum level of capabilities. Well, that is a big mouthful. It should be worth it.
Okay. And so this idea of capabilities and, and risk is, is very similar to duties and duties and rights ethics that we went over uh, last week. So this is kind of an opposite perspective from the utilitarianism um, point of view, right? Because from a utilitarian point of view, you know, uh, generally uh, works on the roads and, and public works like that, those are generally good for the public overall. Um, but, you know, the, um, the, the negative consequences or the negative downsides, um, they're kind of disproportionately carried by certain members of the community that may live next to, um, next to the construction. I remember the first apartment that, uh, that my, my wife and I, we moved into, um, it was great for the first three months, but then they started doing a lot of really heavy construction nearby. And it became a not so nice place to live after that. So we ended up moving from, from there. Um, but yeah, this was a lot of dust, a lot of noise. And, you know, it's great. You know, the, the freeway has a new off ramp, but, uh, you know, um, it was not, it was not pleasant while they were, while they were doing it. Any questions on, on this? Okay. All right, so next let's talk about uh, the general public and, and their approach to risk. Or I should say their, their perception of risk. All right, so this this is actually an interesting uh, interesting topic because I think it's something that's that's evolved actually quite a bit over the last few years, um, and so you know ge generally how the public perceives things is is um, you know a very a very uh, hot topic I guess. Okay. With regards to engineering products in general, um, kind of the um, the difficulty that you'll run into is that what you perceive as risky or not risky in using certain types of technology or certain uh, machines is going to be very different from how the, the public perceives it. Okay. And, and the reason for this is, is, is quite simple because, you know, um, if, you, if you work in an engineering job, you know, you more than likely got an engineering degree. And so you have a lot higher technical knowledge than, uh, than most of the general public. And that's not because the, the general public is, is dumb or anything like that. It's just that, you know, most of them are not going to school for four or five, six years to learn engineering. Okay. And so um, everyone in this room is. And so, you know, that, that's gonna naturally going to give you more knowledge of certain things than, than others. Okay. And so kind of finding a middle ground. And so, um, you know, finding a way to um, kind of have that conversation to, you know, to communicate what things are risky and what's not from an engineering perspective is, is something that's really important, especially if you're trying to get people to, to, to buy your product or use your product, okay? Um, you know, but I think nowadays it's getting more and more difficult. 
All right. And so one one thing that is uh, really challenging to get over is that, you know, when usually when something when someone believes something very strongly, they, they tend to kind of always believe that even even when, you know, um, they're given evidence to the to the, the contrary. And so we call this phenomenon anchoring. Okay. And so, you know, they literally become anchored into kind of one, one belief or one kind of perception. Okay. And so uh, with regards to engineering products and especially new technology, you know, people may have had a really bad experience with, with a certain thing. And, you know, even though maybe things have gotten better, technology has gotten a lot better, um, you know, because they're, they've kind of anchored, they're so anchored into a, a certain, a certain idea or a certain experience, they may always view as, as um, certain things as, as, as risky. Okay. So you know one one example of this is uh, um, you know happens happened in my personal life and it was actually it was it was kind of a, a big issue for a really long time where my father in law um, you know didn't let my wife uh, drive for any distances longer than five miles and so it was uh, he was kind of anchored into this belief and and it's and it's kind of based on his own culture and and uh, and what he believes in too where you know it's it's very dangerous for uh, for women to drive but you know I even though in, even though you know his daughter would drive to LA all the time, and she would come back safe and sound. She would drive to my place. You know, if, if he was there, he would not let her drive. And so, uh, I would always have to go pick her up. And you know, and part of that is, you know, he wants he wants he wants the the boy to come and pick up the girl and stuff like that too. But you know, it was very very difficult to get him to kind of get out of that that way of thinking. He said, you know, cars are very safe now. Your daughter's a very safe driver. She can take care of herself. And so, you know, it, it took a long time for him to get out of out of that. Okay. And what you'll see that, you know, if you're working kind of on a new technology, then um, people are going to be feeling that way as, as, as well. Okay. All Okay, so kind of kind of be prepared, kind of be prepared, uh, prepared for that. Okay, so actually, one good example I, I can uh, think about this in in, in the engineering space. Um, you know, there is a company um, that's that's based up in in NorCal. Um, they're called Heartflow, and so what they do is that they use engineering technology to um, basically help doctors predict and assess cardiovascular disease. And so, um, if you have if you have any kind of cardiovascular disease, you know, something wrong with your heart or your blood vessels. Uh, traditionally, what's what's done is that the doctors have to go in and um, you know perform a medical scan, or they may have to open you up to kind of see what's what's going on. Okay, uh, and that can be very time consuming and very expensive and very kind of traumatic for for the for the patient. Okay, and so what HeartFlow is doing is that you know what they said is that we can we can use engineering technology, we can use um, computational fluid dynamic simulations, and we can predict you know without without the patient having to go through an invasive surgery. How bad a disease is, and whether or not you know we need to operate on on this patient to uh, and fix it. Okay, 
And so it's great. And so they, they have great results. And so they have FDA approval. They've done multiple clinical trials that show kind of the effectiveness of, of their technology. But what they're seeing is that there's, there's very, very slow buy into it because, you know, because understandably, you know, this is people's health on the line, right? And so uh, when people are making this, the decision of, you know, whether or not you know, to have a surgery or not, or whether or not to, um, to get treatment, they want, they don't want a computer telling them that they want like a real you know, doctor to tell them, um, you know, whether or, or to give them health advice, right? And that's because, you know, we are so, are, we're just so used to, we're just so used to uh, that kind of way of thinking. But, you know, even though the technology is great, it works really great. I think it's still going to be an uphill battle from here on just to get people to kind of buy into that because it's, you know, it's, it is um, kind of a, a different, a different thing. And so, you know, it's, it's always going to be challenging. Any anytime you have a new technology to get people to buy in, just because they're so anchored in in how they do stuff. Okay. All right. So what can we do to fix this? Because you know, if if that's if if it's always going to be like that, it's it's always going to be incredibly difficult for any kind of new technology or new engineering to make a positive impact. Okay. Well, there's there's some things that we can do that we we talked about last time. And so one way is that we can um, get obtain free and informed consent. Okay. And so remember when we talked about Tuesday, I said, you know, people, people generally are more accepted or they're more, um, you know, willing to take certain risks if they are informed and they consent to it be beforehand, okay? And so, um, you know, getting information out in kind of a, a way that's easily digestible, that people can really understand, you know, the risk of, 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 uh, of using certain technologies or not, you know, that's, that's going to be the key. Um, but that's also going to be very, very difficult, okay? All right, and so based uh, and so based on this perspective here, you know, based on you know how the public um, views risks, we can come up with another definition of, of an acceptable risk. Okay. And so a risk is acceptable if it, if, it, if it was deemed acceptable under free and informed consent. Okay, so that's very straightforward. So if the person consents to a risk, then obviously it's acceptable. Okay, but they have to be informed about it. And another, uh, another kind of aspect to this is that, you know, when you're talking about the general public, you want to make sure that the, the people that are um, kind of undergoing the risk or, or, or assuming the risk are also going to be one, the ones that benefit as well. Okay. 
And so in other words, you know, if you're, if, if what you're doing or kind of the project that you're undergoing is, is going to be a risk to the public, you want to make sure that the people are, you know, first of all, that the risk is kind of justly distributed and also the people that are undergoing the risk are compensated properly. Okay. All right, uh, any questions on, on this? Okay. All right, so next let's, let's talk about another group of people. So let's talk about uh, the government regulators approach to risk. Okay. And so we saw last time that you know part part of the government's job is to uh, impose laws on engineering um, technology to ensure the health and safety of its citizens. And so based on and so kind of based on that kind of understanding how the government and how the government regulators how they view risk and how they view new technologies is something that's very important for engineers to consider as as well okay And so when you're when you're in that position, so when, when you're in position of a, of a government regulator, where you know you can pass laws or you can pass regulations to to either limit or um, limit certain technologies, there's there's kind of generally two, I would say, extreme approaches that you can you can take. All right, so the first approach that they can take is that, you know, let's say that you are a regulator and, um, you know, a company has developed this kind of new technology, okay? <laughs> it hasn't really, you know, um, they've, they've done, they've kind of done their due diligence, they, they've done their testing, but it hasn't really been released to the general public, yet, right? And so one approach that you can take is to say that, you know, let's, let's go ahead and put it out there and let's kind of wait and see uh, what kinds of effects this is going to have on the public. Okay. 
And so it's only after an incident happens or some kind of negative consequence happens, that's when the regulator will go in and actually pass some, some laws. Okay. So approach one here is just that, you know, um, let's put it out there, let's see what happens. And if something happens, then we'll then we'll do something about it. Okay. And so of course, you know, um, the people that love this approach are usually the engineering companies, the tech, the tech companies, uh, because they don't want to be burdened with regulations kind of before, you know, while they're kind of in the design process. Okay. Um, but, you know, of course, if you're waiting for something bad to happen first, then that something bad is, um, you know, it's, it's going to happen. And so um, generally what people view is that, you know, this kind of approach, it kind of exposes the public to an unnecessary or large level of risk um, and consequences. Okay. All right, so that's that's one kind of extreme. The other extreme is kind of the um, on the other perspective, uh, which I like to call kind of a proactive approach. Okay. And so under the proactive approach, um, what the regulator will do is that they'll go ahead and pass laws to regulate every possible risk that could happen, okay? And so they may not happen yet, but they could happen. And so, you know, um, the proactive way is just to kind of pass laws, make sure that those things don't happen and to kind of protect the public. Okay? And so this approach, of course, would be um, better, at least for the health and safety of, of the public. Uh, but generally, this is this is a policy that that companies don't like because then you know those un, those they have to kind of jump through some more hurdles, they have to do some more steps, and in the end, it, it usually harms their bottom line. Okay.
And some would argue that, you know, this also kind of stifles um, any kind of technological innovation that the company companies may want to do because, you know, why would they, why would they kind of go through all the R and D, um, you know, all the effort that goes with research and development, if they're going to be faced with a bunch of laws and regulations um, on top of that. Okay. All right, so these are kind of the two, I would say, extreme circumstances. So you can, you can almost think of them as kind of two ends of the, of the spectrum, okay? Um, and so, of course, reality is, is usually somewhere in between. So, you know, there's, um, there, there's not completely hands off from the government, but they're also not going to, you know, overly regulate something that, you know, they may not fully understand. Okay, so usually, usually it's kind of somewhere in between where, you know, they'll maybe they'll regulate some things that have kind of shown a certain level of risk, but they'll let the company do some other stuff, um, you know, other than that. Okay. But generally speaking, if you're talking about just a, a, a completely new technology, the government regulators will usually err on the second perspective. Okay. Because what they want to avoid is regulators want to avoid false negatives as much as possible. And by false negative, you know, under this context, the false negative would be something that was initially deemed safe, um, but in the end was was actually not, and it actually causes, um, you know, a lot of incidents for, for people. Okay. Because at the end of the day, you know, these government regulators, they're employees of the government, and the government, at least in theory, should serve its, its citizens, right? And so, you know, their first and foremost responsibility is to make sure that they're, that the citizens and the people are, are safe, okay? And so because of that, they're going to lean more towards the proactive approach, because, you know, um, I think the economic success of a company, of, that's important, you can argue that's important for, you know, uh, for society, but for, you know, before that it comes the health and safety of, of the people. And so, you know, regulars, they want to avoid situations where, you know, they may think something is safe, but it actually gets out there and causes a lot of harm. And so, you know, they're going, they're, they're going to be more proactive in terms of passing laws to make sure that that doesn't, that doesn't happen. Any questions on, on any of this? Okay, and so with that, all that in mind, you know, we can come up with yet another definition for acceptable risk. And so, and so from a regulator's perspective, a risk is deemed accept, acceptable um, if it's one um, where protecting the public from harm has been weighted more heavily than the benefits of the public.
All right. And so, you know, throughout today, you know, we've, we've come up with, you know, several, I think four or five different definitions for acceptable risk. Okay. And so, you know, hopefully the conclusion that you, that you take from this is that everyone, everyone thinks about risk a little bit differently uh, in terms of how it affects them, in terms of, of their experiences and, um, you know, in terms of, you know, maybe what their job is regarding risk. Okay. And so, you know, the way the way that you view risk as an engineer, you know, is is going to be different compared to all these different um, places. And so, if you're working on a technology that's going to be that's going to be involving, you know, all these different groups of people, then you want to make sure that you kind of take those perspectives into account and make sure you're ready to kind of address those as you're kind of ready to present your engineering work to to the public. Okay. Okay. And so now that we've, uh, you know, talked about acceptable risk, let's talk about how we, um, how we actually deal with, you know, determining the causes and the likelihood of, of harm. And we'll talk about the uh, the consequences from uh, from an incident as well. Okay. All right. And so throughout this kind of whole discussion of kind of safety and risk, you know, we we kind of made the assumption that we are able to kind of predict or estimate, you know, what the dangers of using certain technologies are. And so generally speaking, the more accurate your predictions or the more accurate your estimates, um, you know, the better we can we can build safeguards against them. Okay. And so if we can have kind of perfect prediction of, of what's going to happen, then, you know, we can, we can better prevent those, right? And so that, and that in the end, kind of helps lower or eliminate the, um, certain risks, okay? Uh, unfortunately, you know, this is, this is not really easy to do because, you know, there's, there's so much uncertainty that you're working with and, um, you know, a lot of possible things that can happen. And so, you know, just saying that, you know, we need better predictions or we need to predict better, that's, that's great to say, but in practice, that, that's hard to do. Uh, but with that said, you know, there are certain tools that we can use to help us, you know, first of all, list out all the different things that can happen and, uh, um, you know, think about ways that we can prevent these from happening. Okay. 
And so one such tool is uh, something called a fault tree. And so with the fault tree, um, you basically start with some kind of undesirable event or some kind of negative consequence, and then you come up with all the reasons why that may have occurred. Okay. And so that's kind of the start of your tree. Uh, or if you kind of look at the diagram, I'll, I'll show you an example in a second. It kind of looks more like roots more than a tree. Okay. Because what you what you can do from there is that based on the fault tree, um, you can come up, you can kind of build the tree kind of further out. And so, you know, for all the possible causes that may have caused the uh, undesirable event, you can think, you know, what may have caused this. And then you kind of you kind of build kind of a almost like a story or or different uh, kind of leaves of a tree in terms of you know what could have ultimately led up to uh, a negative consequence. Okay, and so these are useful because they, these can be used to anticipate certain hazards um, that you may not have considered before, and it kind of organizes it in a, a nice kind of visual way um, to kind of make it easy to to see. Okay. And so, for example, you know, when you talk about kind of the mechanical failure of a, of a part, right, so mechanical failure of, like, let's say, a, a beam in a building, okay, there are multiple different ways that the beam can fail. And so it can rip apart in tension, it can uh, crumble apart in compression, it can crack or it can bend in bending, it can lose integrity due to corrosion, so there's, there's kind of lots of, lots of different things, okay. And so I have an example for this, and so uh, let me go ahead and uh, switch over, so it's, it's really hard to see otherwise. Right, so this so this is directly from the lecture notes, and so this is uploaded online. Okay, and so this is a fault tree for you know let's say that your car won't start. Okay, and so let's say that you know you you get in your car in the morning, you're about ready to drive to school, but it won't start. Okay, and so there's lots of different ways that you can uh, that you can think of, of as to why your car won't start. Okay? And so maybe your battery's dead, right? and so maybe you know you just don't have any more battery. Maybe the, the starting system was defective. And so, you know, maybe there's something, there's some issue with that in your engine. Maybe there's an issue with the fuel system. Maybe there's an issue with the ignition. Maybe some other um, problem with your engine. Maybe you, you are the, the subject of a teenage uh, TikTok video where they stole something from your engine, okay? And everything else. And so what you can do from here, so those are kind of all the, pri I would consider kind of the primary reasons for, you know, why a car won't start, okay? And then from there, you can kind of, you know, build it further. And so, you know, let's say your battery's dead. And so what are the possible reasons that your battery's dead? And so maybe you have faulty ground connections, maybe the terminals are loose or corroded, uh, maybe the battery's weak, okay? Uh, or maybe you're like me, and I've, I've done this, you know, way too many times in my life that I'm proud of, you know, maybe you left the lights on, um, you know, uh, while you were out to dinner or something, okay? Uh, maybe there's bad weather. So, you know, you can kind of, you can kind of keep building and building this tree until, you know, maybe you arrive at the, um, at the real reason why the car will start, okay? And in the meantime, you know, you kind of build up everything else where you kind of safeguard against all these other things uh, as well, okay? And so a fault tree is, is useful, you know, not just in engineering, but it can be useful for, um, you know, for just a lot of other things in life as well. Uh, we're just about out of time because I want to make sure that I get your um, I get your exams back to you. But another thing I want to show you is something called an event tree. Okay, so event tree is kind of the opposite. And so event tree is, is something like this. And so where a fault tree is, is uh, you know, you're kind of looking in the past in terms of you know what may have caused a negative event. An event tree will kind of detail everything that goes beyond that. Okay? And so let's say that a negative event has happened. And then, you know, you want to predict from here, what are all the other possible negative things that can happen from there? And so, 
you know, if we use the example of your car won't start, if your car won't start, you won't be able to go to class. You won't be able to go to class. You know, we'll miss out on the notes for the day. If you miss out on the notes for the day, you're going to be behind in the class. And then, you know, you can kind of go, go on, um, kind of so on and so forth. Okay. And so I had an activity, you know, obviously we don't have time for it, but, you know, let's say that, uh, you know, we can take a certain uh, kinds of negative events like this, and then you can kind of build an event tree from, uh, from there. Okay. All right. And so, of course, you can do this for fun. I had a couple other activities today that, you know, we, we didn't really have time for, um, but, you know, they are kind of in the lecture notes. And so they're, they're there for you to, to look at. Okay. Um, is this related to the project? Um, you can definitely use one of these in the project. And so you can make a, a, an event tree or a fault tree. Um, I think that would be a good, a good addition to a lot of the projects, um, but it's not a requirement. Any final questions on, on this? Okay, all right. So I'm gonna end class a little bit early today. So if you're here in person, you can come pick up your exams. And so they are up here, right? Uh, if you're on Zoom, I'll bring the exams again next Tuesday so you can pick them up then. Um, but thank you guys for coming today. Um, you know, please, uh, as a reminder, you know, please form your groups. And if you, uh, um, if you haven't formed your groups yet, then, you know, try to find one, use the Discord, talk to people. Um, and so I want, I would like to have all the groups formed before class on Tuesday. All right. All right thanks, everybody. Uh, I Yeah. Yes, I did. I did. I haven't. I haven't graded any of the homework. So I wanted to get grades yeah. first. Oh, do you want but yeah, yeah. I. I. I'll remember to do. Yeah. Juan, any, any final questions? Okay, all right, I'll see you next week.